Hello and welcome to Media Monitor on the SABC News Channel, independent and impartial. Now this is where we take a look inside the world of media, analysing the trends, the issues and the reporting of some of the week's top stories. I'm Peter Ndora and this is what's coming up on the show. Now this week we talked to two SABC journalists uh, to tell us how they've been coping whilst working through the era of COVID-19. Across our borders, two of Mozambique's leading independent newspapers were attacked with petrol bombs and burnt down this uh, past week. We connect with the editor of one of those newspapers to uncover a little bit more about this story. In our news in uh, history feature this week, we take you back to 2007 when South Africa woke up to the tragic news of the death of football star Gift Lereni. So that's the show, but uh, don't forget you can also engage with us on social media using our Twitter handle, and that's hashtag SABC Media Monitor, hashtag SABC Media Monitor. You can also share your views with us on WhatsApp, and that number is on your screen now. It's at 65 4548 65-862-4548. Right, now that's uh, where we want you to get hold of us, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Now, before we get into our highlighted stories on the program though, let's first take a look at what's on the front pages of our Sunday newspapers this morning, starting with the Sunday Times. And the Sunday Times is leading with uh, the paper uh, calling the battle for uh, control of the ANC. President Cyril Ramaphosa says that he'll submit himself before the party's integrity commission to answer questions relating to the funding of his 2017 campaign to become party president. The City Press, let's take a look at that. Well, the, there, President Ramaphosa survives an onslaught, is the cover story there for the City Press. This after he agreed to subject himself before the party's integrity commission. And uh, this is said to have been his saving grace after former President Jacob Zuma and other opponents tried to discredit him ahead of the party's NEC meeting, which has been taking place over the weekend. The Sunday Independent has uh, the headline, The State Rewarding Immigrants, with the president of the political party, South African First, Mari Mario Kumalo, saying that the Department of Home Affairs has been selling documents to foreigners. Kumalo says that uh, the state was rewarding illegal immigrants with jobs instead of deporting them. The Sunday Tribune also sees President Ramaphosa on its front cover saying that his detractors are circling around him, baying for blood. This after calls by party members and it's the NEC led by uh, MP Bongani Bongo for him to face the party's integrity commission. The president has uh, been facing strong calls for him to step down from his position as president in the party. And the Sunday World, also leading with President Ramaphosa with uh, what they're calling his fight back. The paper suggests that those who are corrupt are fighting for their lives as the president is calling for financial disclosures. All of this as the ANC's NEC concludes its special meeting today. All right, so those are your newspapers. We're going to take a look at those a little bit more uh, later on. But first, let's take a look at uh, some of your trending topics on social media, because a lot of people, that's where you get most of your news. Let's take a look. And uh, so these are the top five. Pray for Kaiser Chiefs. And you can imagine they're busy trying to win the Premier League. It's been some years. Uh, Sacred Space is always in the top five. And... Uh, Number four and number two are the ones that I'm going to focus on because Kelly Kumalo and Senzo Meiwa, the City Press has got an article. It Apparently, it's, uh, they're looking at um, somebody, a hitman, who spoke to the City Press and he says that it was Kelly Kumalo. So uh, people have been uh, saying, come on, Kelly Kamala should just sue them for defamation. Some people believe her. Some people say this is nonsense. Hitman says it's Kelly, City Press. And uh, so uh, uh, Tukelo, for example, says, what happened to innocent until proven guilty? I really don't see what Kelly would have benefited in Kelly's answer. So as I said, you know, people have got different views on this and uh, they're um, some incredulous some saying they need to know more 
but that's in the City Press today. Now, it's generally accepted that the media plays a major role in society, being a key source of news and information, particularly during difficult and uncertain times, such as uh, the glo glo COVID-19 global pandemic. Telling the story is not without its challenges, and in the face of an invisible and unknown virus, it also requires some courage to keep on telling the story. And that's why last week the South African National Editors Forum, SANEF, awarded its prestigious Nat Nakasa Award to South Africa's entire body of journalists who've been covering the coronavirus pandemic. Here is a disease, here is a virus that we all know little about, including scientists, but that doesn't stop. And everyone else is told to stay at home, to lock themselves up and to stay safe. But you have journalists on the streets telling that story, um, basically at the heart of the storm, um, trying to unravel this um, virus. And we've lost uh, colleagues along the way. We've had colleagues become infected with COVID-19, um, but that didn't stop us. I mean, you've had newsrooms actually having to be decanted and having to be um, fumigated, for lack of a better word, um, while we're trying to tell the story, but it's an unfolding story. So we thought it important that instead of recognizing one journalist, all of us as the media, as we tell the story, as the story unfolds, all of us are actually deserving of the Bravery Award, the Net Nagasa Award. This is why we decided to give it to each and every journalist in this country who continues to tell that story. So just how hard has it been to tell the COVID-19 story day in and day out over the past few months? To find out, we're now joined uh, by SABC News journalist Lerato Fekisi. She's on the line from uh, Port Elizabeth and also a producer on the SABC special assignment program, Hazel Friedman. Thanks so much indeed for joining us and welcome to the program. Let me start with you, Hazel. Um, COVID-19, um, when it first came, we had absolutely no knowledge. Even the scientists were busy trying to figure it out. And I'm sure that that in itself was the first challenge, even before uh, just being scared to be out on the street. Absolutely. It was, it was such a daunting challenge from the beginning. And, and actually, that's also why I sort of switched over my role from being, being a producer in a documentary series to becoming a news reporter, because it was imperative to go onto the ground and to find out what was happening. And this was in those early days before the death started mounting, when infections, in fact, were still in single-digit figures. Um, but it also, as the weeks went on, we realized what an extraordinary opportunity it presented to journalists to actually do their jobs as truth-tellers, as information seekers and as truth tellers. Um, because in this era of post-truth, it was absolutely imperative to be able to sort fact from fiction and information from inflammation. But also having said that, Peter, you know, of course, we use terms like going onto the front line. And yes, we had to, particularly as television journalists, you can't do a story from the remoteness of your home office. You've got to be out there and you've got to be interviewing and and and, and understanding the stories through the experiences of those on the ground. Um, so being on the front line and encountering the heroism of activists, of ordinary community members who came together, also not knowing what to expect, but were actually reaching out, ready to, 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 to unite and assist struggling communities and learn more about this. And most particularly, coming into contact with healthcare workers who more than anyone else in this country, in this world, were the ones who were the heroes of this pandemic and yet felt so terrified and so traumatized by what lay ahead. They weren't prepared. They weren't prepared with the acceleration that this pandemic hit and the infection rate, but they still stayed the course, they soldiered on. And that for me just, you know, was, was the most incredibly inspiring experience of, of all. 
All right, so that's on the professional front, but what about emotionally? Because, you know, we didn't know, particularly in the early days, do you wear a mask, don't you wear a mask, must you wear gloves, shouldn't you wear gloves? We were busy figuring it out as we went along, and I, and I guess there's always a part of you that thinking, oh my goodness, if I get COVID, that could be it. The weird thing, you know, I think in the beginning, uh, speaking for myself, I had a slightly cavalier attitude. Um, you know, it was during the first few weeks of lockdown and we were essential workers, so we were allowed to be out there. We didn't understand the magnitude of it. And it's, it hit home in a very sad, but thankfully it, it, it didn't work out to be a tragic ending. One of our colleagues at SABC in Cape Town contracted the virus. The irony was she was the only colleague that had not left the office. She was obeying all the rules of lockdown. She would come from her home to work and back home again. The only social environment she was in was at her local shop when she went to get essential supplies. The rest of us were out in the field. We, could have, we were being exposed. We could have been infected. And the one person who contracted the disease and contracted it seriously was somebody who was in the office all the time and she she had to be hospitalized and thankfully she's recovered now but it was a very sobering lesson to us um that everybody is susceptible and that COVID really is everywhere yeah everywhere indeed including the eastern cape which uh, uh, oh. at one point started to race ahead and uh, has been one of the challenging areas and uh, lerato fikisi has uh, been reporting from there lerato how challenging has it been uh, for you as a reporter who's always out there on the streets telling the stories but in a COVID 19 environment what's been like what's it been like for you I think, Peter, the main objective for us as journalists is to obviously inform, educate, and inspire. And I think even during the COVID-19, you're kind of driven by that drive that, you know what, I've got to get the information out there because it was really uncharted waters. It was a virus that none of us knew nothing about. And obviously, the curiosity from the viewer was always there. So I will admit that there were times where I was anxious, where I was scared. But I think the desire to inform as a journalist is just innate in you that no matter what, I've got mm -hmm. to get the information out there and I've get, got to get the viewers to know what's going on. So as scared as I was, I wanted to find out as a journalist, not only for myself, but the millions of viewers that we have to educate, how is it like to be a survivor post-COVID because people were speaking about life post-COVID as if it was normal. And I wanted to also find out when you're in a quarantine stadium, for instance, the one that you have in PE, how is it like to be COVID-19 positive, put in a room with people you don't know, or fighting a common enemy. So I think the desire for me to inform and educate people many a time superseded the fear and anxiety that I felt. But it was really, really scary, Peter, especially because I'm a mom to a two-year-old and many times I feared, you know, what if I take the virus home? as much as I want to be brave and face the fire, but I've got a family back home, I've got a husband back home, so if I then take the virus back home in my eagerness to get the story out, what happens to them? Where do we quarantine? How do we quarantine? Um, so it was really such a, and continues to be such a different way of doing journalism. But like I say, uh, Peter, you know, there was no greater joy for me than to know that uh, people know what it's like to have COVID-19. People know what the symptoms are like, as different as they were for some people and from every single person, they differ to person. But I think the joy came back from knowing that out there during these uncertain times, our viewers are able to know exactly what is happening at our hospitals, our hospitals in good condition. They're able to know, you know what, if I'm feeling this and that, it is a COVID-19 mm -hmm. symptom or it's not. So I think the, the, the passion for journalism for me has been ignited. And above all, it's just... Um, it made me, made me realize that, you know what, over and above everything else, important thing is for us to tell the story and to tell the story from this time, for this time in a long time, from the perspective of those that are suffering, those that have felt, the, you know, the, the tough side of this virus. Mm. I mean, there's the other side of the story, and I think uh, as it progressed, we started to understand that uh, there were recoveries as well. And uh, I, I wonder at what point did you start to think, actually, you know what, more people are surviving this and that maybe this story needs to be told a bit more as well. Yes, because so I think that the, the, the recent story that I just did, I think, was this 
first two weeks of August was actually a story on survivors. And I think that for me was like a breath of fresh air because for a long time we've been speaking about the numbers going up. Eastern Cape was uh, at one time the third highest in the province was speaking of poor hospital conditions. It was such a gloomy time, and I think especially in, towards the end of July. Then, you know, I started to change my mind and I wanted to find out exactly, you know, are people surviving? And, I, and I've got a lot of people on Facebook saying, you know, what, let's try to change the narrative. Let's now tell people that you know what, you can have the virus. You probably will have the virus because the numbers were so high. But above all, you can survive. And when you have survived, you still face complications. So it was nice now to actually change the narrative and switch the plug a bit and be like, okay, you know what? Yes, the infections are high. Yes, you must still um, adhere to regulations. But there is life post-COVID and there's a life of, of, of victory post-COVID. So it's nice now to actually not only just say that because perhaps the numbers are going down, but to actually interview people that have said, you know what? I had COVID. Some really extreme people. Some having it for two to three months but still surviving. So it was nice to see that balance where you had people that had it for two weeks and were okay, people that had it for three months and really, really hit um, symptoms, and then to say, you know what, I'm still alive. So that then went out to the media, and people started seeing hope that, you know what, COVID, as much it was portrayed as this really dangerous virus, but you can survive and you can live. And I also, I think it instilled like a fight to experience in people, to show that, you know what, as much as I've got this virus, so many people, as I've seen in the story shown by the Lerato, that I can still make and I can still live because COVID is not really a death threat. Yeah. Um, Hazel, as we start to wrap up this conversation, I mean, there was a whole new normal that we've uh, suddenly had to uh, do uh, as journalists. Uh, before, you didn't have to have a mask, then you had to have microphones that were extended. Uh, take us through some of the challenges of the new way of reporting uh, because of COVID. Absolutely. We had to be meticulous in terms of sanitation. We had to, as you said, uh, you know, use mics and stand at a certain distance, not interview interviewees with, uh, without masks. Um, but it was also going, it wasn't just the equipment and our own personal um, uh, prevention measures that we had to be aware of. We were going into environments that could not um, afford social isolation. We were going into very cramped environments, very conge congested environments and to high risk environments. Hospitals where, thankfully, in the latter days of, of, of this pandemic, protocols are definitely more in place. Um, but it was always the risk of going into environments where pe some people would be cognizant of just how um, careful they had to be um, to, to prevent a spread and, 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 and to, to enforce con to containment, but never ever being certain about that, particularly environments where emotions were very inflamed. Um, there was so much anger. There was a lot of hope, um, but there was so much anger as well within communities. And as you saw, a lot of service delivery protests, rioting. And in those environments, everything becomes inflamed. And you had to be aware of your own safety, not just physically, but in terms of this virus. You had to be aware of the protocols. But at the same time, you had to be there to try and tell the story as, 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 as well as you could and in as balanced and unemotional way as you could in an environment that was just igniting with, with, with fear and confusion and, and, and fear of the unknown. So, All right. Hazel, we're going to leave it there with you, but we're going to chat again a little bit later on because you're going to help us uh, unpack the, the papers. All right, that's Hazel Friedman, who's uh, with uh, the special assignment team. But uh, last question uh, for you, um, Lorato. I, I suppose it's been a journey for all of us. And uh, I wonder, how do you think you have changed as a journalist as a result of covering such a global story? I think, number one, um, Peter, it's really changed the way that I do journalism in the sense that we had to think like there was no box. It's something else to think outside the box, but we had to think um, like there was no box, like Hazel was speaking earlier on, that there was now, um, you had to adhere to social distancing, we had to use extended mics, you had to make sure that you're safe while telling the story. But I think for me, it's really taught me that you've got to be an innovative journalist, that you've got to think like there is no box, you've got to use, especially social media, Peter, I found that social media was such a relevant tool at this time, and something that I think we are growing on as journalists, but we can still do better on, especially myself. So I really I really think it's made me, number one, realize the importance of having good contacts because unlike before where stories were given to us perhaps on a silver platter, this time you had to go out, find out, go out for yourself 
and go find the story for yourself and go find the victims for yourself and the survivors for yourself. So it's totally the importance of really having good connections and good contacts, especially within the media fraternity, and also being aware of what's happening in our communities all the time because we are their voice. And then secondly, it's taught me that you've got to really do journalism differently. You've got to be innovative. You've got to really maximize on the various tools in terms of social media that we have and how we can maximize on those. And the reason why I say that, Peter, I think the stadium, stadium story that I did on people quarantine at the stadium, that story was done all by people at the stadium. Obviously, I couldn't go in because we're all COVID-19 patients. But I had to, through social media, teach them how to take a video using their phone because we're all um, inside the stadium quarantined. And I had to teach them um, via my phone how to hold the phone sideways, how to record a video, how to make sure it's good quality. Mm -hmm. So it's really taught us that we've got to be innovative, got to be creative. And above all, we've got to really work as a team both yeah. cameramen and the reporter that, you know, you, you can't work in isolation. You, you're only as strong as your cameraman is. So they're really valuable lessons that I've learned as a journalist about creativity, innovation, um, hard work, and always just having that drive that over and above all, you know, it's about telling the story. And also telling the story from the, the perspective of the viewer. You know, sometimes as journalists, we want to tell the stories ourselves. But I think our people on the ground have such beautiful stories to tell. And I think when you allow them to be their own voices, it makes such a difference to the content of our work. Well, and you're telling those stories really well. Thank you so much indeed, Lerato Figgis, who's uh, one of our star reporters uh, operating out of the Eastern Cape. All right, so we're going to take a quick break, and uh, when we come back, we'll go to Mozambique. And can you believe newspapers being petrol bombed? This is stuff of the apartheid era, but it's happening in 2020. Stay with us. doesn't get better than this. Speco. Want to find great? Follow me. New listings. Whatever you're looking for, you'll find it on Yap. Yap has a range of great traders and suppliers. Those are our artists. Let me take you to the painters. There you go. All local, all vetted and all star rated. Find great on yep.co.za. Ikamalam dum sindiswa. Ikamale project here to Papa Ama Community Project. See a subtitle police. Send a show by way of sale. Umetlukum Kunuba, Amakawaza and Sapuli Long Shobo. If Vacum Shobo in a net by project reaches to Ganjali. Mabis and Mameli Reto is not as quanto, Sicilia Pizlani. So Shobo in a snake take a cool. Welcome back. You're still watching Media Monitor. Now, two of Mozambique's leading independent newspapers were firebombed uh, this last week. Uh, the, week, uh, the weekly newspaper Canal de Mozambique and the daily Canal Moz uh, were attacked with petrol bombs uh, completely destroying the offices and equipment. A container of gasoline fuel believed to have been used in the attack was found at the site. The papers are privately owned and are often critical of government. A shocking story, certainly, and as I said, you know, some of these images that you see are reminiscent of the apartheid era, but uh, certainly uh, something that uh, worries us that it's happening in 2020. Well, to tell us more about this attack and uh, what it means, I'm now joined uh, by Matthias Gente, who's the editor of one of those uh, publications, uh, Canal du Mozambique. Uh, thank you so much indeed for joining us, Matthias. Welcome to the program. Morning, thank you. Como está? Estou bem. I'm good. I'm doing great. <laughs> good, good. So tell us a little bit about this story. I mean, it's incredible to hear that newspapers are 
being bombed during peacetime. What happened? Um, as you say in your introduction, <laughs> this, this image uh, makes you rem re uh, remember at the apartheid time, but uh, now in 2020, we are living it in, in Mozambique. Um, what happening? It's um, a very, very, very tragic uh, st st story. Um, on Sunday, um, last Sunday, um, unknown people uh, they broke into our our offices and uh, they spilled petrol on all our materials and they drop uh, artisanal bombs and they catch fire called the office and we we lost all material something interesting here is that uh they came um on sunday morning and they vandalized it, the main entrance um where our office is uh where, where we have our office it's also a, re a residential building and uh our, our neighbors they didn't saw anything uh but they saw that the the main entrance the main gate where vandalized by they didn't took it serious they thought oh we can fix it uh, on monday or but they didn't uh, understood that mm -hmm. it was a a, pre uh, a preparative act uh, for for any tragical incident at night do you know why your newspaper was targeted why your newspaper um we, we, I think we know um, we were targets because um, our, our editorial line, um, we, we are a very critical newspaper to, to the government. And, and I think we, we are not uh, 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 critical. It's not uh, a, a correct word. But uh, we, we, write and we write and we... Sorry, uh, yeah. we, we write all the story about the governance, about the accountability. So we think that this kind of this kind of stories that we write, they don't please uh, um, some sector of our of our government. And in this sector, it's uh, it's it's reacting with violence. If we if we if we make an, an, an a retrospective, um, this is. Uh, this is. Uh, we think this this bombing. It's uh, it's related with with other events that that's coming to happen. Um, in December uh, thirty one last year, uh, I, I I was abducted and uh, they tried to kidnapping me. They tried to take me off from my car to their car. And uh, uh, by miracle, by, by a miracle, it didn't happen. Mm. And I was very injured, and I stay home um, two months um, without go to work. And uh, after that, uh, there came a, a rain of uh, uh, judicial processes against us. Many uh, uh, suitcases came against us. One of which one of them I'm answering now. It's in court. I'm, I'm being uh, accused of uh, uh, viol violating uh, state secrets and other, other, other process that, are, that are, uh, uh, I will take time to mentioning here. But uh, it's uh, more than 10 yeah. um, processes that are in court now. But this is this, the last one. It's, uh, it's uh, the most evident. Um, I'm being accused. I, I uh, particularly in the, the, the paper, we are being accused of violating the state secret because we published a, a memorandum or a contract between our our, our government with the, the the multinational the the oil and gas multinational that's operating in Cap Delgado, and uh, the the government uh, in, in the view we violated that contract was a secret a state secret. Um, what's what, what's happening? It's uh, that. Uh, there is a contract that that says yeah. the the oil and gas comp the oil and gas company uh, uh the oil the our army protects the oil and gas company but the money is going in a private account which is held by um 
a former defense minister, what we say is very weird. And uh, we, we wrote about that, that story and we exposed that contract. After that, we, we received a, a suitcase uh, against us uh, on violating uh, state secret process. After the, after, this, uh, after the process, I went to the court and they say that they will call us again. And after that, the bombing, the bombing the offs. All right. So it's not just you, though, is it? I mean, it's journalists in general that have been harassed. I, I noticed that uh, President Yusi's advisor, uh, Guido Vaz, wrote on his Facebook page, the attacks should not be used. This is uh, talking about uh, the, the militant attacks in the north of the country. They should not be used to sell newspapers. And he described the papers reporting on the conflict as news agencies of extremist attackers. So people are being... Um, persecuted and attacked for reporting what's happening in northern Mozambique. So journalists, journalists being harassed generally. Uh, in, in this particular uh, uh, issue uh, about Cap Delgado, uh, it's, a, it's now a no-go zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, journalists are being... Uh, Kidnapping are being uh, in jail, and uh, as as you are quoting, as you advise, it's a, 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 a piece mouth of our of, of the government, and uh, he always wrote things like that. And for him, it's normal. And the, what is uh, what's important here is the, is is the is the, to see a judge not as a judge as a person. A judge he actually represents a strategic. Um, it, it, the strategic and the thoughts of our government, and uh, you, you as a person, you should take a Zidu as a represent as, as a rep, uh, as a rep, uh, representative of, of our government. And uh, these kinds of things are happening when the Zidu is still saying that uh, uh, we deserve what is happening. Mm -hmm. um, there is a colleague of us who's running a. a a website called the Zitamar News. Baz also wrote that that it's he's a foreigner called Tom Tom Bauker. He said he wrote he said Tom Bauker must be expelled from the country. He also wrote that uh, the journalists who are working in uh, in Cap Delgado they must they, they must suffer consequence because they are exposing the weakness of our army. So this is the environment that we are working for, and nothing happened to Egidio Baz. All right. So what are the authorities saying about the petrol bombing of uh, your newspapers? Are they investigating it? Are they not going to do anything? What, what, what's happening? Um, they, say they, they say that they, they are investigating it. Um, we went to the <laughs> short story. I, went, I personally went to the police station just to report what's happening. They took two hours just to open a case and to give us a number. Why? Because uh, the, the, the permanent uh, official, he was saying that he was waiting for superior order just to open a case and give us a number. We went there at, at uh, 10 p.m. and we left we leave the, the police station at midnight. And... Uh, this is um this is uh the it shows how it's going to what's going to happen and the next day uh the the the, the police uh the, the investigative investig investigative police police came at uh, at, at our office and they, the first question that they ask is are you um there is there, there is no one is angry here against you Oh, against the paper, they were they, they were asking our our staff, and uh, this shows where the investigate this investigation is going, because and we don't believe actually we don't believe that it's going to be an investigation, because since um, December thirty one there is an going investigation on my uh, attempt uh, attempt to, to kidnapping, but uh, there is no uh, a result on that investigation and and. Uh, until now, they didn't tell us anything on that. And we don't believe that this, it's going to, 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 to get any result. All right. Matthias, we're going to have to leave it there. But thanks 
so oh, much for bravely you telling us your story because I know that this uh, might cause some problems for you. But thank you so much uh, for your courage and uh, good luck with uh, uh, carrying on with your newspaper. Thank you. Okay. Adeus, muito obrigado. Uh, Matthias Gente, who's uh, an editor of one of the newspapers that was petrol bombed in Mozambique uh, uh, this last week, and uh, telling the story of uh, ha journalists being harassed generally by authorities. A spokesperson for the uh, um, uh, president uh, suggesting that uh, these people deserve what they get. Very sad to see that development in Mozambique. When we come back, we'll go to Botswana, where we start to talk about a new uh, body of journalists, uh, human rights journalists, actually, in Southern Africa. Find out all about that right now. Bugasha family forms part of over 400 families who are still awaiting the receipt of their complete homes. This despite claims by the matter that they have handed over 600 units. All I'm longing for is for this house to be finished. I have no hope as I don't have a child who is working. We had hoped that these houses would have been complete by now so that people can be safe. What we've done now is to go back onto the tendering system so that we can reaward the project. We very much understand of the frustration of the people of Pilton. We have opted to go to the media because we are not getting answers from the authorities. We live in a new high-tech environment. Because of technology, some of the world's wealthier people are tech entrepreneurs. Tech is how we play and how we work. For your tech conversation, join me, Pumelele Zondi, on Network every Sunday at 8.30 p.m. Welcome back. You're watching Media Monitor. Now, Zimbabwean journalist Hopul Chinono, who has been held in prison for more than a month, has been denied bail for a third time this week, while police continue arresting government critics. Uh, Chinono should uh, remain in jail. In Harare, magistrate uh, was uh, ruled on Monday. Chinono is awaiting trial for allegedly encouraging people to participate in an anti-government anti demonstration that was planned for July the 31st, but which was foiled by police and the military. He's been in custody since his arrest on July the 20th. His trial date has not yet been set, but will return to court for a routine remand hearing in September. Media watchdog uh, committee to protect uh, journalists, the CPJ, on Friday urged uh, Libyan authorities to immediately release a local journalist detained whilst covering recent anti-government protests in the capital Tripoli. Libyan radio journalist uh, Sami al-Sharif was uh, detained Sunday by men in military uniforms affiliated with the UN-recognized government of national accord, according to a statement released uh, on Thursday by the New York-based organization, the CPJ. All right, it's uh, quite disheartening to see all these stories of uh, challenges that uh, journalists uh, are facing across the continent. We were speaking about Mozambique a short while ago, Zimbabwe and Libya now as well. And we'll continue to feature all of these stories so that people are aware of just how difficult it is sometimes to be a journalist on our continent. 
Now, we go back in history, and this week's feature, we take you back to the year 2007. And this is when South Africa woke up to the tragic news of the death of football star Gift Leremi. This is how the SABC covered that story. Condolences are still pouring in from across the country following the death of Mamelodi Sundowns midfielder Gift Leremi. The 22-year-old player was killed in an accident near Alberton, southeast of Johannesburg last night. Leremi was driving alone at the time of the accident. Federation's Cup. The cause of the accident hasn't been established. We woke up this morning hearing the news and in the radio and uh, around about nine, half past nine, we got the confirmation that Kif Leremi has passed away in an accident. Leremi is the third professional player to lose his life in a car accident in recent years. The others, Leslie Manyatela and Conrad Hendricks. His death came as a shock to the Brazilians' camp. Today's training session was called off. What can one do? You know, this is God's will. Uh, we're only praying for the family to be strong. We're praying for Sundown supporters to be strong. We're praying for Sundown's players. Leremi moved from Orlando Pirates only a month ago after spending his entire career with the Bucks. So for us, you know, as football, you know, this talent that we lose at this young age is really regrettable. But, you know, it's in the hands of God that he understands the time you know, in place as to when we live in this world. And the same to the family, uh, uh, our condolences. Many experts tipped the Remy to make the Bafana Bafana team in 2010. However, the Remy saw his share of controversy. He was recently acquitted of assault and has been in trouble with coaches for skipping training and alleged drinking binges. It's not yet known what the funeral arrangements are. Sfeso Ramaram, SABC News, Johannesburg. Yeah, very sad story indeed. Okay, so let's uh, go to our international uh, editor feature. And this week uh, we are going to neighbouring Botswana to chat with uh, Queen uh, Musarwa, who's uh, the Interim General Secretary for the soon-to-be-formed Journalists for Human Rights Southern Africa. A very good morning to you, Queen. Thanks very much indeed for joining us and uh, welcome to the programme. Hello, Queen, can you hear me? All right, it looks like that picture is frozen. We're going to try and get hold of her again. Uh, but we want to talk about uh, this uh, job that, uh, that uh, this uh, organization that they're setting up, uh, this uh, uh, Journalists for Human Rights in Southern Africa. And uh, you would imagine that uh, something like this is quite important, especially given what we were just talking about, events that have played out in Mozambique, where uh, journalists are being abducted by uh, uh, what looks like state authorities. And uh, then we have Zimbabwe, where journalists that seem to be under fire for uh, being critical of government. The authorities there are seen to be uh, are, are using the courts and the system uh, to uh, uh, keep journalists in jail and uh, harass them one way or the other. So um, perhaps this organization, Journalists for Human Rights Southern Africa, perhaps might be able to tackle some of those challenges. And uh, we'll try and get hold of Queen uh, Musarwe. Uh, during the course of this break, so stay with us. If you haven't called Outurance to find out if they can save you money on your car insurance, you're in luck, because if they can't beat what you're currently paying, now you can ask them for 500 Rand. And if you've been with the same insurer and claim free for the past three years, then tell them you want a massive 1,500 Rand. <laughs> Savings or cash, you always get something out. SMS card to 44211 or call 08600 60000 for a quote. 
Broadcasting plays an important role in the development and advancement of women as well as the issues that they face. Having more women in broadcasting means that we can be able to reveal live experiences. Our voices as women in broadcasting are important to ensure that diverse content is included. My presence challenges stereotypes. It fights bias, it forces change, and celebrates the potential of women. The kind of work we do in broadcasting allows us to rewrite history. Our strength is in our unity, and women can defy the odds. See expressions, city hala la zimbogoto, hala la makawegas, happy women's man. Catch your number one youth current affairs show, Expressions, every Saturday at 5 a.m. Welcome back. This is Media Monitor. Let's go to Botswana now and speak to Queen Musarwa, who's uh, talking to us about this newly formed organization, Journalists for Human Rights Southern Africa. Queen, thanks so much indeed for joining us. So why Thank do we you need... Thank so much, Peter, for having me. It's a pleasure. What, why do we need yet another organization for journalists, and this one particularly focused on human rights? Uh, maybe I should just start by correcting the name yeah. of the organization as Human Rights Journalists for Southern Africa. Right. And our objectives really were journalists will collectively expose wrongdoings in their countries. Mm. Um, one of the one of the the objectives again is to promote access to information and enhance investigative journalists, journalism on human rights violations, All right. as How well as promote cross-border collaboration among journalists within the SADC region on human rights reporting and investigative journalism. All right, so t talk to us about this cross-border collaboration. What will that look like, for example? It's, it, it's, it's going to be an online publication, just as you would have a website where different countries uh, contribute to stories. So far, we have six countries that will be doing that. All right. We have, uh, mem yes, we do have Botswana, we have Eswatini, we have Zimbabwe, we have Lesotho, we have Malawi and South Africa. All right, so your work will be to expose human rights violations uh, in Southern Africa and tell the stories. Uh, and, I, and I would imagine sometimes it's difficult if you're inside a country to tell the story. Would your colleagues then in the other parts of the uh, 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 grouping tell those stories? Yes, um, it's one of our objectives, really, because we have realized that in some countries, you just spoke of Hope Chinono in, in Zimbabwe, that in some countries we do have our colleagues who are not freely, uh, who cannot freely write uh, stories that expose wrongdoings in the public administration, that cannot expose human rights violations. So this platform affords them or enables them to be to write stories and have them on this platform that we'll be having. All right. So when does it get off the ground? Is it operational already? We are launching tomorrow. We're going to have a virtual launch tomorrow at 9 o'clock. We, we had wanted to have launched it earlier because we started this last year. Um, so because of the COVID pandemic, we've not been able to launch. But we just realized, look, a visual launch will do. So we are launching tomorrow at nine o'clock. Well, we wish you the very best of luck and I'm hoping that we can chat to you again about the launch and uh, see how things are going. Good luck tomorrow. Uh, thank you so much. Great. That's uh, Queen Musarwe, who's uh, part of a new grouping of journalists trying to tell the stories of uh, human rights violations uh, in Southern Africa. And they're launching tomorrow. We'll keep tabs for you on that story. All right, uh, we move on. And uh, coming up after the break, we'll be taking a look at the papers here at home.
Te doens was een rustige area, toe ek nog een kind was. Manne wat sam met my gehoed geraak het, het in dwelms geval. Ek is naar en buis, ek het die pad gekies, wat vir my veiliger is, en dis om rugby te speel. Ek speel hier vir die local club, de Doorings United. Ek sê wie sê het my leven baie verander as kind. Hoe meer rugby gekyk het op TV, hoe beter het ek geword. So dit my geleer, wat die mens ek moet wees, dier SABC2, wat het moeilijk gemaakt het. The special rapporteur on the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. Congratulations on your appointment. It's fantastic, um, I think, to be entrusted and given the responsibility of such a big uh, mandate is something that I don't take lightly. The biggest role as a special rapporteur on health is to advise the UN on the global trends that are emerging, so that work continues. I have today signed a proclamation authorizing the Special Investigating Unit, the SIU, to immediately investigate any unlawful or improper conduct in the procurement of any goods, any works and services during or related to the national state of disaster in any state institution. Right, so last few minutes of the show and this is where we take a look at uh, Sunday newspapers here and uh, we welcome back uh, Hazel Friedman once again to take us through that. Hazel, thanks so much for joining us again and I know that uh, one of the papers that you picked up is uh, Friday's edition of the Weekly Mail and Guardian. What's in there that grabbed your attention? Okay, well for me the utmost, well, the, the story of utmost importance and not just during COVID but beyond is the primary pandemic of South Africa, and that is gender-based violence. And on the front page of the Mail and Guardian, you have here 200 cases a day, 35,000 back a case of 35,000 backlog of DNA tests, which prevents victims and survivors from having their day in court, from seeing their perpetrators convicted. Often, what happens is their perpetrators land up living among them while court cases are delayed for literally years while DNA, te uh, DNA samples are not being tested. And again, the politicians talk the talk. We've had gender summits. We've had interim steering commissions, uh, committees to set up uh, uh, gender-based council, uh, councils. We've had funds allocated. We've had other resources, which I won't go into now because I'm busy investigating to see what happened to these resources. All these resources that should be going to NGOs, to activists, to survivors on the ground, to support them and protect them, and these resources are not seeing, not 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 seeing the light of day in the places where they are most needed. And for me, it's an ongoing travesty. And uh, you know, it, it, one can march so long, one can have so many memorandums, and and one can get a response that is what we want to hear in terms of action being taken. But unless those resources find their way to those who need them most on the ground, I'm afraid gender-based violence is going to be this, not a stain, but a wound, a festering wound that it, we're not going to recover from as a country. Oh, tragic story. So that's story. my first. Okay. And then uh, you've got a minute to tell us about your Sunday Times story. The Sunday Times story is something that I was alerted to many, many weeks days of lockdown by employees at a call center at Discovery. Now, mm. Discovery has been lauded as being, uh, you know, on call for its members to assist with COVID tests, to assist with um, any kind of advice. But the very call center, um, the, the, the call center operators that take those calls have allegedly been badly treated. Not only were apparently um, health protocols not instituted in the environments where they worked, but when and many of them were infected and 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 were forced into isolation and then had to come back to work they said that there wasn't sufficient uh, deep cleansing offices right. but what makes so we're running out of time but briefly i suppose a healthcare provider not health caring it seems like 
Correct, correct. In its own backyard, in its own living room, not so caring for the workers who are there to assist the public. All right, Hazel, we've got to go. But thanks so much indeed. Keep up the great work. Really proud of the stuff that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Peter. All right, Hazel Friedman from Special Assignment. And that's uh, where we're going to leave it. Thank you very much indeed for tuning in and watching Media Monitor. We hope that uh, you'll join us again next week at the same time, at the same place. And uh, from me and the rest of the team, have a great week. But please, always wear one of these. Bye-bye. We live in a new high-tech environment because of the